Hi, everybody. This is Tracy Marie with Table Talk. Thank you so much for joining me today. I want to take this time to talk to you. I know that you've already probably seen a lot of different videos pertaining to this topic about the black church, but I think this is going to be a little different because a lot of the videos that you're seeing, while they are very important and a lot of them are very accurate, it's talking a lot about the things that we're seeing in leadership in the black church. And we're going to go over some of that as well. But I want to also talk about the responsibility of the members of the body of Christ, each and every one of us that are followers of Christ, that have given our lives to the Lord and our accountability and our responsibility to upholding the word of God. So many of us out there are following man more than we are following God. And what's going on in the black church, it is, it's disheartening. It is, it makes me angry with a spiritual anger. And it is frustrating because it's like you have so many of us out here that are trying to speak the truth of God's word. You have God's true prophets and his true ministers and his true visionaries and his seers. Um, those of us who have been called to do these specific things, these specific gifts that God has given us. And I'm telling you for the last, I, I know that I started seeing it in 2013 where prophets were speaking and, and God was just doing so much in the prophetic warning and exposing and it, for some reason it's like church folk don't get it and so I started saying to myself yeah we can start looking at the preachers and we can start looking at the leaders but wait a minute when are church folk going to start taking some accountability for their own walk with Christ because at the end of the day when when we stand before the Lord you can't say well God I did what my pastor told me to do and I stayed because I you know I prayed about it and I just felt like he's my leader and no 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 we have to get to the point where we take accountability for our own actions in every phase or every part of our lives. We can't keep passing the buck onto the leaders. Yeah, we may know what they're doing. Those of the those of the leaders out there that are just straight wrong and straight just wicked in what they're doing. But at the end of the day, when you stay under leadership that you know is wrong, when you stay in a, in a position or you stay in a church that you know is not following the word of God to the letter, then you're just as guilty as they are. You don't get off because you're condoning it. And so, you know, I'm going to put it out there right now. Okay. Um, Cause I already know you're going to have those people that want to debate. This is no debate. We're not debating this. The only thing that you need to provide is the word of God. If you feel that there is something that I've said that is an error, by all means, please bring it to my attention, but bring it with the word of God. I don't do opinions. That's the problem with the church today. Everybody has an opinion, but don't nobody want to open up the word of God and just see what the Lord says. What does Christ say? Oh, we don't care about that because we become so arrogant and haughty that we literally feel that our opinions mean more than what God says. What? My God, how dare we think that? So, yeah, this is not, you know, please, for, for the religious folk out there that just, you know, you don't read your Bibles and, and basically anything you know about the scriptures, you kind of just twist it and turn it because you don't really understand it. You just go by what you heard. No, I'm telling you, open up your word of God. OK, I don't care how much you love your church members, or your church family or your mama, or your daddy. Listen, if what God says goes against what we were taught, then guess what? Who do we follow? We still follow God. So I don't care what I was raised to believe. If the if God has exposed the truth to me, his truth to me, then it is for me to be obedient to what the Lord says, regardless of what anybody else says. And so, you know, I, I want to share this with you because I know there are so many people out there 
that have gone through what I've gone through, have lived that kind of life that I've lived. You're just a church per- church person. You grew up in church all your life. You've been in church since you were a kid. Um, that may not be all of you, but I know for me, this is my story. Okay. And I'm not saying that things are not happening in, you know, the white church or the Spanish church, or, but I will say this, I've had the opportunity to visit other churches that had a higher percentage of different races. And I'm telling you what I experienced in the black church is something that I've never seen before. And it it's like, we have to get to a point where we got to start calling stuff out. The reason why a lot of these leaders are doing what they do is because we let them get away with it and they can do just about anything. And you better believe that their followers will just let them slide on everything. So, you know, I just want to share some things with you because like I said, I grew up in church since I was a little, a little something. I grew up in church at my grandmom's knee. Um, and if you hear any noise in the background, I apologize. That's probably a plane if you can hear it. But I grew up in church, deliverance evangelistic church. Um, I don't live in Philadelphia anymore, but I was born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, I went to deliverance evangelistic church the majority of my life until I got married and then left to go to a different church. But that's where I got my foundation. And um, in Logan, Broaden, Wyoming, under the tutelage of Pastor Benjamin Smith. And that was the greatest experience that I had because the pastor was so wonderfully humble. And he was doing so many great things, but because he was so humble about it, you didn't even know. Like, I didn't even know for, I, for years, I did not know he was on the radio. For years, I did not know that there were pastors that came from other parts of the country to come to our church to, to learn from him and to be mentored by him on how to be a leader and how to do church right. I didn't even know that T.D. Jakes before, while he was still down south, I don't know if it was North Carolina, but before he even became who he is today, before he even started, when he was still in a storefront, he came to Philadelphia to visit our church and to uh, talk to my pastor. And at that time, I, I didn't even know a lot of that stuff because he was so humble. His wife was so humble. She was a sweet lady. I mean, she would sit on the front row and just, just humble, nothing flamboyant, nothing flashy, you know? And so there was such an anointing on him and I've seen him, you know, cast out demons and I've seen him raise up other young people or other people to walk in their gifts, but he was also firm. He didn't play. He would sit you down in an instant. He didn't play that. He called for us to walk in holiness. You hear me? When we had to sing, when I was on the junior choir, when we had to sing, we big earrings, makeup, what? Listen, if you could get away, maybe you might be able to do a little tiny bit of eyeliner and some lip gloss. And I'm talking the clear lip gloss. And we wore white blouses with long black skirts. Okay. You could not, because we were taught that we were to decrease so that Christ would be increased because the word of God says that if we lift, if Christ be lifted up, he will draw all men unto him, all people unto him. Not if we be lifted up. So we were taught that we were to be humble. We were to be modest when we were in ministry. Okay. So I had a really, really good foundation where, you know, he had a team of people that were really teaching us and preparing us to walk in our assignments as God was preparing us, you know, and I am so grateful for that because I know a lot of people didn't get that, you know, and again, there was accountability. We were sat down. If we weren't walking, if we weren't walking in holiness and righteousness, then no, 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 you don't get to minister. You need to get your life right because God's main concern is that you're living holy. He's not caring that you can preach your face off. He's not caring that you can sing your face off. He doesn't care about that. You understand? So that was what I learned young and it was instilled in me. Okay. And at that time I didn't, I didn't even understand how great of a lesson of, of teachings that I was getting while I was at the church. I was a kid, you know, then you become a teenager. So I personally 
did not have a true relationship with God. I went to church because I was raised to go to church, you know, and it was just what you did. And so you see the older people praising God and shouting, and I didn't understand it, but I just knew, and I was always taught that I was to always respect and honor God. And that was it. You understand? I was just taught that. And so even though I didn't have a personal relationship with him because I was taught at a young age to have a respect and honor for God, I always did. Now, I don't know what happened, but man, something shifted in the atmosphere. And I truly believe this is when we started to see the introduction of false teachers and false prophets coming on the scene. And when that happened, we started seeing things start to shift because now it seemed like we we started to walk away or move away from holiness and we started getting caught up a lot in gifts and talents, you know? And so it seemed like we were more focused on a good preacher and um, if he could preach you under the fl- under the, um, the seats in the church or, if, you know, if he could make you pass out under the spirit or if they could sing and they could riff and they could harmonize something slowly. And I'm going to tell you, the enemy is very crafty in how he does things. He will come to us and he will do it sneakily so that you don't even know it's happening until it is bold in your face and all you're doing is standing there like what in the world happened but something happened and I'm I'm gonna say maybe it started happening I noticed things starting to happen maybe in the early 90s like when the whole hip-hop thing really started taking off in the um in the music realm that's when things started changing because if you remember the wine did a song with Teddy Riley called It's Time to Make a Change. Um, so we started seeing now that the church was starting to become a little more worldly. And, you know, even in the way they were starting to dress and, and the different things that were going on, nothing like today, of course, but it was starting slowly there. And because nobody stepped up and I guess started speaking on it because it was done so um, snidely that when it started to really become major, it was like it just took over. So now when we look around, we are seeing, you know, gospel artists or they call themselves gospel artists. You know, now they call themselves gospel entertainers. You know, they entertain you with the gospel. That's a lie from the pit of hell because gospel is not to, gospel is not meant to entertain you. The gospel is meant to change you. And so I don't know. It's just, you know, slowly. And for me, again, remember, for a long time, I was religious. I just believed that I was supposed to go to church. Now, if you ask me why back then, I would just say because, you know, I respect God. I I honor God. But you know what's funny is that my love for God was not truly sincere. I had a fear for God because I, I was taught to do that. But I never had a relationship with my father, you know, so I just went to church because that's what you were supposed to do, you know. And so a lot of the stuff that was happening, I didn't even understand and recognize that these were man-made traditions and things that were happening that weren't even spiritual or scriptural until I got to the point. And, And for me. I and don't I can tell you that the Holy Spirit speaks to us. We can never say the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to us. When you get that feeling in your in your gut, when you get something that just gnaws at you and it's something that you're uncomfortable with and you know it's not right. That's the Holy Spirit letting you know that something is wrong with what's happening. So for me, it was the fact first and foremost the tie thing, okay? When, you know, because back then, you know, we were diff- going to different churches and fellowshipping with different churches within our denomination, of course. Yeah, we'll talk about that too, denominations, because that's another lie from the pit of hell. Denominations for what? So anyway, hopefully I'll remember to go back to that point. But we used to fellowship with different churches, right? So, you know, 
I guess every pastor has their own thing. But let me tell you something. I remember a pastor um, that was in uh, Pennsylvania. I can't remember. I think it was like Lincolnia, Pennsylvania or Trevos, Pennsylvania, something like that. And he would make the tither stand up. All the people that tithe would stand up. You know, and I and I said to myself at that at that moment, I felt such a I felt such a, a uncomfortable, um, cold feeling. And I didn't know what it was. And I didn't know at the time that it was the Holy Spirit that was letting me know that this was not of God. You understand? It wasn't of God that you would have people stand up if they tithing and the other people that couldn't tithe or didn't tithe were looked upon as to be ostracized or judged or criticized. And I'm, I thought that was the most despicable thing for me to see something like that. And again, as I started, you know, being in church and, uh, and we fellowship with different churches. And then when I would start to see stuff where, you know, uh, the so-called pastor or the guest pastor or the prophet would say, the, the Holy Spirit just told me that there are 20 people in here and that you have a hundred dollars and God said, you are to get up now and you are to get to um, bring forth that money. So if that's you come on up and stand in line. And, rem- and I don't know if some, if, I don't know if a lot of you out there went through that, but I'm pretty sure some of you did. And you remember that they would literally hold you captive in that church and make you literally sit there until them 20 people got up. And you felt that, that you thought that that's what was supposed to happen until you went to the scriptures and you read the scriptures where, you know, the word specifically told us that we are not to feel like we are not to, to give begrudgingly. We are not to feel like we're being coerced to give. God wants us to be cheerful givers, you know? So that that whole situation completely goes against the word of God. So back then, see, I didn't know that. And you know why I didn't know that? Because I was, I was foolish. I was ignorant. I wasn't studying my word like I should have. So I was trusting people that were in leadership because I just automatically thought, well, they're in leadership. They're supposed to do right. And that's what a lot of you all out there are doing. You think because they carry a title, because they wear that robe because they wear that collar. Oh, they holy men of God. They're holy women of God. They're supposed to do right lies. Oh no, you don't. You better, you better believe it. The word of God says what test the spirit by the spirit. And the word of God also talks about the fact, and you know what, now that I'm thinking about it, let me see if I can pull that up where it says that, because I know I had the scripture and when I read it, I was like, wow, I love to read the word of God. Because, you know, no matter how many times you've been in the word of God, something will always just amaze you something. And you can also read the same scripture and you'll see it in a different way. The next time you read it, where it's like God will actually open up your mind even more to truly understand what it means. But this is and you know what I'm going to. I'm going to read this whole thing and it's pretty long, you guys, and I'm. I'm not going to say I'm sorry because I'm not sorry. You need to hear it and you can study it for yourself. I'm going to also put it in the description box. But again, like I said on the last video, if you listen to that about um, Christians and astrology and horoscopes, it's your responsibility to read the word of God and nobody should have to make you do it. You should want to know the word of God for yourself. You should want that. How do you think you're going to fight against the temptations and the tricks of the enemy? You're not going to know anything until you know the word of God. Your spirit needs that word and it needs to chew on the word of God so that when you come into situations, I mean, the word of God will quicken into your heart and your mind and you will remember what the word of God says about a lot of things. So it will turn on your signal to let you know or your your alarm or alert. It'll alert you. Um, to know when something is wrong or something is, is, is not of God because you know that word. So this is second Corinthians 11 and it's three through 15. And so what, this is what the word says. It says, but I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. 
I do not think I am the least inferior to those super apostles. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of, and I believe that is Achaia, will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. And I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Okay, that is powerful, absolutely powerful. But I, my problem today and, and what I've been dealing with is the fact that I'm seeing a lot of my brothers and sisters in the church and you know you see wrong and you're not saying anything. You're not doing anything. And some of you have become so loyal to your pastors and your first ladies, you know, and um, let, so that you know, first lady is not scriptural. So, OK, we'll, we'll talk about that another time. But, yeah, all these man-made traditions and these man-made titles that are created by people so that they can feel, you know, above you, better than you. You understand? Haughty, arrogant, puffed up. Come on. You understand we should be uplifting Christ, but we are seeing so much stuff going on in the church. Listen, I um, came across a, a video by accident of Mary Mary. I don't listen to a lot of gospel of today because a lot of these gospel artists, they're not living a holy life. OK, they are all in it for the money. OK, and they show it in their actions. They they are they uh, sign contracts with these worldly uh, record labels. Mm -mm -mm, no, listen. Um, they were giving their sister a bachelorette party. And I'm going to leave that link in the description box so you can go to it for yourself. And they had these men coming in the downstairs, okay, with no shirts on. And they up there rubbing on the men. Now, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Holy, we are holy. And you got some men Coming to a bachelorette party. Now, a bachelorette party for, for, for the first, um, first of all, it is a worldly concept. It is a worldly practice. What the heck are y'all doing that for? But y'all married women. And whether you're married or you're single, y'all say you're saved. You say you're righteous. You say you're holy. And you got these secular worldly men coming downstairs serving you topless. And y'all rubbing on them and y'all lusting after them. And we're supposed, and guess what? The church folk loved it. Oh, they couldn't wait to turn to we so they could watch Mary Mary. Oh, yeah, because you know why? Well, because they love the Lord, you know, and they, they, they sing gospel music. They don't sing that R&B. They don't sing that secular. Are you serious? So you're telling me that so because we, you know, top off anything that we do, as long as we put Jesus in it, that makes it holy. Are you, are, are we really, are, is that how we're thinking? Because the enemy has truly uh, bewitched somebody. He has truly fooled a lot of God's people. If people are believing that you can act like the world and do what the world does. But as long as you incorporate the word or the name Jesus, that it, it solidifies everything. It makes everything holy. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. And so what the enemy has done in the last, probably, especially the last two decades, 
I say two to three decades is that he has he has caused entertainment to become the main focus in a lot of churches in the body of Christ. So we draw people in with the praise team or the choir and the great music and the great band. And we put on the dancing and, you know, oh, we, and we entertain everybody because if we can entertain you and keep your attention that way, you don't even realize that you're not being fed correctly. You don't even realize all of the stuff that's going on. That's not even of God because you're being entertained. I mean, it's just, I, I don't even know. It, it just hurts me. We're looking at Sunday's best. And we got people, supposed, supposed Christians, competing against each other to see who is the best singer, who is Sunday's best. And we have these gospel entertainers that are s- sitting down and judging them and, and cr- you know, critiquing them. And, you know, you should have did this or you couldn't, you didn't do that. And you got to work on this. Are you kidding me? Now, I need to ask you this question. We're in the word of God. Do you see this? Where do you see Jesus or the disciples or the apostles? Where do you see this happening in the word of God? Where do you say, where do you see this behavior and practice being okay in the word of God? Think about it. And this is the thing. Some of you are so addicted to entertainment that you will fight for it. You will make excuses and you will do everything you can to come against the word of God. Because you've become carnal in your thinking and in your behavior. And so it's okay for you to see Mary Mary, you know, with uh, topless men. You know, and and this is and to you, even though you and some of you know it's wrong, but you watch it. Why? Because it entertains you. Do we need to talk about the preachers of L.A.? And let me tell you something. If you look at Sunday's best and then look at American Idol, what makes it different? Please tell me what makes it different. And let's talk about preachers of of, of, I think of uh, L.A. Yeah, preachers of L.A. I can't even. I think the pictures will say it best. I think the pictures say it best. What's the difference between the preachers of L- of L.A. and uh, hip hop? What's that show called? Love and Hip Hop Atlanta. What's the difference? Please, please tell me. Oh, I know. God is in it because they talk about God and because they talk about Christ. Let me tell you something. Mm-mm. No, no, no. Because the word of God, again, what does it say? That if Jesus Christ be lifted up on the earth, he will draw all men unto himself. So what does, why do I need to know about your love life? Why do I need to know about your personal life? Why do I care? That's none of my business. That's none of our business. You understand? So you're on television and who are you promoting? Because your dog won't show you promoting the Lord. So let's stop that lie. You're promoting yourself. And that's what we, we are seeing in the church today and in the black church especially. And I speak about the black church because that's where most of my experience has been. And so for me, as I start, God was starting to speak to me, even though I didn't even know that the Lord, you know, because my respect for God was always sincere. And so as I continued to go to church, you know, by this time I was married as when I got older, I got, I was married. I had two children and, you know, my husband was, or my, shall I say my ex-husband at that time, he abandoned me and my children. But when we were married, you know, he was the minister of music and he started messing around with one of the young ladies on his choir at the church. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The church knew about it. The pastor knew about it. The choir knew about it. And guess what? They continued to keep him in that role of minister of music. And they knew that he wasn't doing right by me and my children. And did anybody call me to make sure I was okay? Did anybody stop by? Did anybody ask me if I needed anything? Oh, no. You know why? Because they were mesmerized by him because he was talented. He was good at bringing music stuff together. And he knew some um, celebrities. He had uh, friends that were big time musicians in the R&B world. Oh, so they were mesmerized. So he and he was drawing people to the church. And that's what the pastor wanted. Because, look, I need numbers. I want people filling up those seats because the more people you get in here, the more money we get. Come on. Now it's a business. 
Now, listen, I'm not talking to about every church because you have some churches out there where the pastors, where leadership, they're on point. They love God. They are obedient. They are submitted to God and his purpose. You know, they love God's people. They have a heart for God's people and they are doing some phenomenal work in their communities. They are, you know, really leading uh, God's people in a positive and, and correct way. So this is not about them. The problem is, is that there are more, unfortunately, we're seeing more negative stuff. And I'm not just talking with these people on television and the people in, you know, the spotlight. I'm talking about the stuff that I've seen in my years growing up in the church. And so, you know, as I became a single mother raising my children on my own, when I tell you that I, I I thought that by being obedient to my pastor, by making sure I was always at church, by, you know, sharing my gifts and my talents with the church, that God was pleased. So, you know, here you're talking about somebody that at the time I'm taking care of two children. I'm working one job, trying to maintain ministry at my church. I was on the praise team. Um, and where I lived at, at the time, I didn't have a vehicle, so we would have to catch the bus. So... Where I lived at, you know, for those of you in Philadelphia, you probably already know, or you're familiar with Northeast, you know, we have different sections in Philadelphia. Well, I was in the Northeast uh, section. My church was in West Philadelphia. So we used to have to catch a bus, a train and a trolley just to get there. Okay. So that's not even including coming back home. Okay. I was on the praise team. So I would have to be there twice a week for rehearsal. And we had Bible study the same day as rehearsal. And then of course, church. So um, this particular time they were they were planning it was some type of service, you know, black folk is good for coming up with all these different services. And um, they wanted and they asked me if I was going to be there because I was on the praise team. Now, this was a night service. Now, the church was located in a very bad neighborhood. It was not a good neighborhood at all. It was known for, you know, drug dealing and um, a lot of crack heads were in that area, a lot of shooting and just all kinds of criminal activity went on in that area, you know? So, you know, I told my pastor, I said, listen, I said, I'm not going to be there. I said, first and foremost, I have to, it was on a, a weeknight. So I was like, I have to make sure, you know, that my children are taken care of and I'm not going to have me and my children standing on the corner at 10 o'clock or later at night waiting to go home. And we, it took us an hour and a half to get to church and it took us an hour and a half to get home. Okay. And you think I'm gonna have me and my babies on a trolley, a subway, and then a, tr a, a bus at that time of night. Are you serious? Do you know what the pastor said? The pastor tells me, well, if you truly love the Lord and if you really have faith in God, then you know, he ain't, ain't going to let nothing happen to you. Really? Th this is what he said. Now I'm saying to myself, cause at that time I was all about the whole spiritual father, spiritual mother thing. I don't believe that stuff anymore, but I was all about that because again, I wasn't studying the word for myself and I was just going along with what was tradition in the church. I just thought it was the right thing to do. So, but in my spirit, I knew that that was wrong because I'm saying to myself, if I was your blood daughter, are you telling me you would have your blood daughter on the corner with her kids, with your grandkids waiting for some bus at night or some trolley at night? I don't think so. So I told him, uh, yeah, I won't be there. Because, and this is the funny thing, because I'm talking about, you're talking about the love of God. And if I really love the Lord and if I have faith, where was your love to say, well, you know what, Tracy, I agree that, you know, it's going to be late at night. I don't want you and those babies on that corner. So tell you what, I really, you know, need you to be here. Um, it, I'll get you a ride. I'll make sure that you guys get home safe. Now, I could even respect that, but he didn't offer that. But him and his wife were going to be getting home safe that night in their car. You understand? And other members of the churches, the other, you know, that have vehicles. But he didn't think to say, OK, you know what? Let me get you a ride because I don't want you out there because you, you, you got to use wisdom and you're definitely right. No, he didn't do that. But I did the right thing and I kept me and my kids home. I'm not playing that. And that's when I really started getting leery. And then another thing that was really making me know that something wasn't right was we had an anniversary service and I was the event planner for the service. And, um, it was, 
I mean, that's another show that we can, that's another discussion we're going to talk about because I'm, tr- I'm pretty sure a lot of you out there got a lot of stories of the things that you know you saw that just were not of God, but you didn't say anything because you thought that it was what we were supposed to do. You thought you were doing it as unto the Lord. And because you're doing it as unto the Lord, you're overlooking the dysfunction you're overlooking the things that you know are not of God or that don't line up with the word of God because you're saying I'm doing it as unto the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -mm. You know, we have to call those things out. We have to expose it. We have to be honest with it. And we can't allow people to do whatever they want to do simply because they have a title or a position. You understand God's word is God's word for all people. And so there was a, um, we had this anniversary and the night of the anniversary, The pastor came to me and said that for all the pastoral guests, the pastors and their wives, he wanted them to be announced when they walked through the door. Yeah, he wanted them to be announced as they walked through the door. And I said, and right there, I felt it in my spirit. I said, that's not of God. That is complete boastfulness. How arrogant is that? But I did it because I felt like, well, I'm being obedient to the pastor. I didn't know any better. But the day came when I I got tired because I said, okay, I said, God, you said in your word that I'm supposed to experience this liberty that, that Christ died for, that I may be free. I said, but I feel so bound. And I, I was talking to God and I said, God, I'm done. I'm tired. I said, I'm trying to be a good mom. I'm trying to take care of my home. I'm trying to work a full-time job. I'm trying to be active in church. And I said, God, I am tired because it seems like no matter what I do at the church, they're not satisfied unless I'm constantly there doing what they need me to do. But nobody's helping me and my kids. Nobody's looking out for us. And I said to myself, this, I said, God, I'm tired. I'm not, I don't feel free. I feel bound. I said, Lord, I love you. I said, but I can't keep doing it. At that moment, I had made up in my mind. I said, I'm leaving. I'm out of the church. I said, I'm going to take a sabbatical from this because I need a break. And as sure and as clear, it was crystal. I heard the Lord say, the reason why you feel the way you feel is because you've been pleasing people and not pleasing me. And that changed my life because after that, I said, okay, God, this is going to be just me and you. I need to know you. And this is the first time, man, and I don't want to cry, but this is the first time where my love story, who with the Lord began, man, that's when my life changed Because I said, Lord, I've got to know you for myself. i got to know you for myself, God. And if I haven't been pleasing you, Father, please show me. Show me how. Help me, Father. I want to serve you, God. I want to know you for myself. And I made the decision. I needed to fast. I had to. I needed to experience God. I wanted to experience him for myself. And so I decided to fast. Oh, man, this was back. Oh, Lord, this was like 2000. Oh, 2000. I think about maybe 2003, 2004. Yeah. Now, mind you, I told you, look, and I grew up in the 70s and 80s and, and, you know, on onward, you know, so I had been in church a good long time and it wasn't until the early 2000s after I had just given so much of myself and I was done, I was burnt out. And all that time, I didn't even know the Lord the way that I could have because I was too busy trying to please people trying to please the pastor. You know how much I saw other people trying to impress the pastor and his wife. I used to hear people bragging about, oh yeah, you know, pastor um, and his wife invited us to their house. And oh my gosh, oh my gosh, 
the politicking and stuff that went on in the church, the competitions and who does the pa- the nepotism and the favoritism and oh Lord, it was just so much. So for 40 days, 40 nights I fasted and it was just, I did um just bread and you know, like I, and you know, I just bread basically all types of different breads, bagels, um, uh, different types of bread with butter. Sometimes I put cheese on it, but basically bread and water and juices and nothing else. And I prayed every day and every night. I got up in the morning and I prayed and I studied my word. And then I would go to, um, before I went to bed, I prayed, I studied my word. And I tell you, <laughs> if I guess I learned what it meant to bomb, bom- they'd say bombard heaven. I guess so, because I, I meant that. I said, God, I need to know you for myself. I need you and I want you. And you got to show me who you are. You got to show me. Okay. Because I, if, if I'm going to hold on and if I'm going to maintain my, my, my relationship, or if I'm going to start a relationship with you, you got to show me who you are, honey. Whew. I fasted those 40 days and nights and on the 41st night, I will never forget it. And I was uh, on my knees praying and just spending time with the Lord. Because listen, when you go those many days and you, you, you create a pattern and a behavior for yourself and you're just, you become accustomed to doing it. And so I just started praying. And as I started to pray to the Lord, tongues came out and it scared the mess out of me. And this is how I know that our God has a sense of humor. He, he has to, well, he made us funny. He gave us a sense of humor. So I have to believe he has a sense of humor. And the reason why I say that is because I was always, I was always anti tongues, you know, (laughs) I would like people that spoke in tongues. I was, I was like, y'all are so fake, you know, and I just didn't buy it. I was like, I don't believe in that stuff, you know? And so I was just one of those people that just didn't really buy the whole tongue speaking in tongues thing. So wouldn't it be funny for the Lord to give me that gift? (laughs) I'm trying to tell you, God is amazing. So I was on my knees praying and these tongues came out and I literally stopped myself and I I started to bind the devil. I'm like, that ain't nothing but the devil. I rebuke you. (laughs) Oh gosh, I was such an innocent one. I didn't know I was still growing in the Lord really for the first time, truly being introduced to who God was. I was a true baby, so I didn't know. So all I knew is that I love the Lord so much with all my heart. So I start praying again and these tongues. And can I tell you something? They were the prettiest tongues. I mean, I can't even explain to you. It was beautiful. And it was so funny because I didn't know it at the time, but my son was standing at the door because he heard me speaking in tongues. So I guess when he heard it, he had to come and find out what is that? And I didn't know he was standing at the door at the time. And I'm just praying and I start speaking in these tongues and I experience, oh, I'm so emotional sometimes. I'm such a girly girl. But when you have experienced God for yourself, I'm telling you, you never forget it. And it's the best experience in the world. And to experience him that way, it was just, it was so intimate. And it was so close and I felt him like I had never felt him before. And it just changed my life. And I'm going to always be grateful to him for that. The fact that he met me right where I was and he let me see him and experience him. That just changed my world. It changed my life. It changed my heart. It changed the way I thought about him. And it was that night that I fell in love with him. It was a love that I had never felt before. And it was that night that I said, Lord, I will serve you with my whole heart, my whole mind. I will sing your praises. I will never turn away from you, God. I'm going to hold on to you, Father. Just like a little girl that holds on to her daddy's knee and she don't let go. I'm going to hold on to you. I'm never letting go, God. I'm never letting go. And it's been like that ever since.
I have been in love with him so much. And he has been so faithful to me. So faithful. And I am so loyal to him. You know, I tell my my children. And I tell my husband. Yes, I'm married now. And I actually have a, a husband. A good one. Thank God. And... That's another story we'll talk about. <laughs> but um, I tell them all, I say, I love y'all with all my heart, but I love God more. And I just do because God had me even when I didn't know he had me. When I look back over all those days when I saw that the Lord was there and didn't even know he was there. But that moment that night, I fell in love with him heavy, hard. And so I am sold out for him. I love him with all my heart. And so when I see other brothers and sisters that are allowing things to happen that they know are not of God, don't you know that it hurts him? Don't you know that it it angers him? Why would you want to hurt your Lord if you say you really love him? So then I have to say to myself, do a lot of these people out here, do they really love the Lord? You're seeing all this stuff happening and you're seeing all this things that are not of God, the, the, the complete arrogance and haughtiness and the, the spirit of self, self gratification. You understand self acknowledgement, that spirit that Satan had. Remember how Satan had that spirit. He wanted to be God. Do you you understand that same spirit exists? So we see all these people, you know, the pastors and the leaders in their robes. And, you know, the word of God speaks about that as well. I'm going to leave all of these scriptures in the description box for you. Um, My journey has been a wonderful one. It's been, oh, I've, trust me, I've had some growing pains. Believe me, <laughs> you know, any relationship that you have, you know, you're going to go through those moments. But with God, oh, my Lord, y'all, mm, I would never want to make it without him. I just love him so much. He's been the best thing for me. And he has loved me more than anyone has ever loved me. And he has been there for me. In so many ways, he has made himself present and he has made himself evident in my life consistently. And so through the years since that time in 2000, I believe 2003, I've grown tremendously and God has led me into the point now of a prophetess. Who would have ever thought (laughs) if you all knew me? If you knew the kind of person that I was, (laughs) you know, my sense of humor and just who I am, being a prophetess, it's like, wow, I would have never thought that. And, you know, just the other gifts that God has given me that, you know, he is allowing me to use for his glory and for the assignments that he has given me. But it, it hurts me so bad to see all of the sin, the wickedness, the flesh, the self going on in the churches. And we can talk about these leaders over and over again. But what I'm asking you is, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? Are you speaking for righteousness sake? Are you speaking up on the word of God? Or are you just sitting there and just participating in it because you don't want to rock the boat? Are you one of those people out there that are more concerned about your position Are you trying to, you know, rub elbows or rub shoulders with the people that have titles and positions and all that because you want to have what they have? You want the fame, you want the popularity, you want the money, you want the authority. If you recognize that you may not have been faithful to God or you haven't been loyal to the Lord, And you haven't upholded, you haven't upheld his word. You haven't walked in obedience or maybe you've turned a blind eye. You still have time to get it right. 
you still have time to seek the Lord for yourself with a whole heart, a sincere heart. And ask the Lord to show you first, show you you. And then after that, show you the truth of the situation that you're in, whether it's your church, whether it's the people that you're connected to. You understand we have to stand up for righteousness sake and we have to uphold the word of God, period. And, you know, when people come on and they want to debate and argue, that's nothing but a distraction from the enemy to, again, take us away from the word of God. God is not pleased with this behavior. God has called us out as his children. We are to be holy. We are set apart from the world. We are not to walk like them, talk like them, look like them, think like them, act like them. We are supposed to be the light to their darkness. And instead, it seems like we're seeing a lot of darkness in the church. So I honestly didn't even mean to be before you this long, but this really is something that I'm so passionate about. And I, all I want to do is see people get it right so that you are heavy, heaven ready and you are truly ready for Christ's return. I know that we've heard it for so long as some of us have become numb to the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back one day. For his church without a spot or a wrinkle. So I'm going to ask you to examine yourself. Examine your heart. Ask the Lord to help you examine yourself. Through true eyes. Through spiritual eyes. So that he can help you correct those things that you know are wrong. And if you are around people. Or if you are under leadership that you know is not of God. Walk away. Because I'm telling you right now, the modern day church is becoming more wicked and more wicked. I'm telling you, the day shall come where those of you that are still in the modern day church are going to flee from it. If you are truly sold out to the Lord and you truly are are wanting to do his will. If you haven't left already, the day shall come. I'm telling you, the wickedness. Man, the false pot, the false prophets, the false apostles, the false teachers, they are out there and they are plentiful in this country. It's the truth. Oh, okay. Um, there's so much more that I want to talk to you about. And I'm going to be taking time out to work on some other things that, that we need to discuss and that you need to know about. And by all means, you know, please, if you have questions or if you have comments, all I'm asking you is, you know, don't be negative because I'm not I'm not here for that. I'm not. I just truly care about my brothers and sisters who really, really, really want to get it right with the Lord, who really want to turn away from sin, who really want to turn away from, you know, the antichrist behaviors that we're seeing in the church that really want to turn away from man-made traditions and ideologies and really just want to live the life that they are supposed to live, the life that Christ died for that we would be able to live. So with that, again, I'm going to leave the description um, in the description box. I'm going to leave some pertinent scriptures that you can review for yourself. Um, I'm also going to leave that link when I told you about Mary Mary and that whole bachelorette party thing. I'm going to leave that link in my in the description box so you can see it for yourself. Um, it's just so much. Like I said, false prophecy, just false, just all kinds of foolishness. We got to come together, y'all. We have to unite and we have to help each other so that we are unified in Christ. OK, so. That we have no excuse. And when we have to stand before the Lord, you understand we are in right standing. We are in right standing and we can hear him say, well done. Well done. You did not fall. You did not fall for the okie doke. You did not get caught up in the lies. You did not get caught up in the traps. You did not go towards what was easy. Man, it may be hard now, but it'll be worth it then. So. I love you guys so much. You know, drop me a comment. You know, um, you can always reach out to me. I'll leave my email address um, in the description box as well. And as, all, as always, you know my, 
my thoughts, you know my hope for you. I hope that you live better, think better, do better, and have better according to God's will and his purpose for your life. Until the next time, I'll see you when I see you.